Hey guys, I'm Chris Ignato and you're watching my YouTube channel. So thanks a lot for that. So I want to talk to you about one of my friends today and her name is Alina. She is a black rat snake. Now black rat snakes can be found throughout most of Pennsylvania, a lot of New York, New Jersey, and just about most of the eastern United States. These are really cool species. They're actually pretty common even though you don't see them a whole lot. Being a black rat snake, well, She's black, but not black entirely. As you can see, there are there is a little bit of patterning on her that you do see. And black rat snakes do have a pale chin, fairly white chin. But Alina here has a little bit of yellow on her chin because she is also part Everglades rat snake. Also, Alina herself could get anywhere between 6 feet to 8 feet long. So it's a pretty big snake. Black rat snakes often get confused with black racers though because they're both big black snakes. But you can actually tell the difference if you look closely enough. The rat snakes generally have white between their scales, sometimes orangey colored, sometimes red or brown, but there's usually white between the scales. Black racers, the whole snake's black. And you usually don't get that close to a black uh, racer because they just dart off, you know, hence the name racer. They're really fast. And they're aggressive too, if you handle one, you got a fair chance that it's going to strike at you. Whereas you hold a black rat snake, even a wild one, there's a good chance it's not going to bite you. They're usually pretty friendly, just like Alina here, even wild ones. Um, but they do strike sometimes. They, they do like to warn you first, before they strike, by vibrating their tail against the leaves and stuff. They wiggle it real fast, and it sounds like a rattlesnake. Now, a lot of people kill these, as I said. One, they're big snakes that does scare a lot of people and there's a lot of people who are just afraid of snakes in general you don't want to kill these guys rat snakes are the farmers friend they like to feed on you know rats and mice and things like that which as you know rats and mice are major pests to farmers however sometimes the rat snakes will eat birds and even bird eggs we don't have a whole lot of snakes in this area that do that if you were to look close at the rat snake you do realize that it scales are actually semi-keeled. It's really hard to see that though. You would think that it's a smooth scale, but if you look closely enough, you'll see that they're not. Another thing about the rat snakes is that these snakes are actually pretty arboreal, which means they spend a lot of time up in the trees. They'll climb up a, even a smooth bark tree, like a beech tree, as if there was a ladder on it. They just shoot right up the thing, like no problem. Another reason why you don't see these snakes too often is they're up in the trees. You just don't see, you walk right past it. They do blend in really good on the ground and stuff like that though, too. So the way they subdue their prey, obviously is not through venom. They'll constrict their prey. They'll strike out at it and then wrap around the prey and suffocate it and then proceed to consume the animal. Of course, being a snake, there are a lot of things that like to eat them also. In fact, hawks and owls like to eat these guys and foxes, raccoons, and even bobcats. But that's usually when they're younger. Once the rat snakes are fully grown, as I said, six to eight feet, they generally don't have any natural predators. Not in our region. So they're good to go at that point. Now I did tell you they're arboreal, but they're equally at home in water. You put one of these snakes in the water and it just darts along as if it spent its whole life in the water. They're excellent swimmers as are a lot of snakes. There are reptiles, which means they're ectothermic. Ectotherms are animals that rely on the temperature of their environment to give them their appropriate body temperature. So what that generally means is if it's a cold morning, the snake's not gonna be able to move that fast. Its body temperature is going to be lower. But as the day heats up like today, the warmer it gets, the faster the snake's gonna be able to move and the quicker their vision will be too, by the way. And they have an excellent sense of smell. You see her sticking her tongue out a lot. Well, that's because she uses her tongue to smell the environment. They have this organ in their mouth. They pull the tongue into it. It's called a Jacobson's organ. 
So that actually de deciphers the molecules and pheromones. It's basically like smelling with their tongue. Pretty cool stuff. Also, being snakes, they don't have ears, but they do sense vibrations very well. In fact, sometimes they'll even hunt down their prey based solely on the vibrations that prey is making on the ground and stuff. So what I want to do is hand Alina over to my girlfriend, Ivy Darling. because She's got some things to say too, and she spends a lot of time with Alina. Hey, Ivy. Hey, love. Here you go. Thank you. Here's my girlfriend, Ivy. So there's a bunch of things I wanted to say about Alina because while Chris is off most days working at Churchville and teaching, I spend a lot of time with her because I work at home on the computer. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is because she's arboreal, it's really important if you have a snake that's arboreal to put branches in their, their tank because she was a lot happier after we did that because she likes to have things, you know, to curl around and go in and out of and stuff. After I was living with Chris for a while, I decided to start taking Alina out during the day in the summer, just for like, you know, 15, 20 minutes out in the yard. Stood right next to her, very careful, you know, because she can be fast when she wants to. But I noticed for the first few days when I would take her out, she's doing this. She's making this kind of motion. And I was telling Chris about it after he got home from work and we were trying to figure out, you know, what that could be. We had all these different guesses. After a few days, she stopped doing it. So I was like, huh, that's different. Well, I guess this is like a week or two later, he came home from work the one day and he comes out in the yard and I was out with Alina and he sits down on the hammock. We have a hammock out there that's kind of, you know, flat, not one that curls up. And I thought, oh, Alina will love that. You know, she can go in and out of the, the ropes. So I put her on the hammock. Well, next thing you know, she starts doing this again. And that's when we realized it's depth perception. That's why she was doing it. A few days in the grass and she figured it out. You know, it was no biggie. The hammock was a new situation. Yeah, she wanted to investigate that. You know, she's a snake. All snakes are predators. There's no vegetarian snakes out there. <laughs> and if you look at predators, generally predators worldwide, regardless of species, they have stereoscopic eyes. Their eyes are placed generally on the front of their heads. Even praying mantises and sharks, right? And the, the reason for that is it gives them depth perception, okay? They can tell that how far away an object is. When the two eyes are distanced apart, it allows them to zero in on that depth. So, Alina's eyes, they're only that far apart, okay? There's not a whole lot of depth perception going on there. So waving her head back and forth, just like the praying mantis, allows her to really fine tune the distance between her and the object that she's curious about whether she's hunting or about to go on to another branch it doesn't matter another thing I wanted to bring up is a quick story about when I first moved in and I first started handling Alina and Chris would warn me say you know she's really fast you gotta be careful you don't want her to get lost and she likes to go in my shirt a lot so at the time she was in my shirt and I was so busy on the computer I got distracted and I thought she was still there and she wasn't and it was awful. It was awful. We tore the house apart. We looked in every nook and cranny, could not find her. So three months go by, right? It's Christmas Eve. I come upstairs in the middle of the night to get a drink from the kitchen and to use the bathroom and my cat's acting all weird in the corner, you know? And I go over there and there's Alina. Couldn't believe it. He was sure that she got out. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, I brought her downstairs. I gave her a drink right away. She got a big drink. But aside from being a little thinner, she was okay. You know, she was fine. I made sure, you know, she got fed almost right away the next day. And she was able to go all that time comfortably, I think, without food or water. Yeah, that's that's one of the advantages to, to being ectothermic is a meal can last you quite a long time. Us humans, you know, 98.6 degrees inside our body, we have to maintain that homeostasis. So we have to keep eating food and burning that fuel to, keep, to maintain that body temperature. Well, reptiles and things, they rely on that, the environmental temperature, right? So they don't have to be burning all these calories to maintain that body temperature. So a meal for them can last quite some time. That's another really great survival trait for reptiles and any creature that's that way. 
Now she's being pretty calm right now, but earlier she was very busy. You know, as the sun heats up and the warmer she gets, the busier she's going to get, the more active. Sure. Now, as all you snake people know, as she gets bigger and bigger, her skin gets smaller and smaller, and she has to shed it every once in a while. It's a really neat process. I kind of like watching it. It's pretty cool. Different snakes, I've noticed with the different um, foster snakes that we've had, will take different periods of time to shed. We had a corn snake that we were fostering, and she would turn, she was uh, orange and yellow. And when she would start to turn pink and purple, I swear, pink and purple, that's how we knew she was getting ready to shed. She only took three days tops and she was done. As where Alina, when she starts to shed, she'll take a week, sometimes more. And the way I know when she's ready is, her, at first her eyes will get that milky, opaque color. Sometimes it's like a light blue or even a strong white. And once that goes away and fades back to normal, it'll be about two to three days after that that she'll come out and shed. Also, after they shed, you gotta make water available because they're really, really thirsty afterwards. Because they will stop eating and drinking several days before they start their shed. So if you give your, your snake a mouse or a rat and it doesn't eat it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's sick. It might just be getting ready to shed in a few days. And while they're shedding, you really shouldn't bother them. You shouldn't handle them that much because they can't see very well, if at all sometimes. And it makes them nervous to be out, you know, when they don't know what's going on and what's around them. I'm going to give her back to Chris now, and we're going to try to see if we can get some video footage of her on the ground and in a, and in a tree. <laughs> she I don't know what that was. <laughs> she likes to have something to hang on to. She, it makes her very nervous when she doesn't have something to hang on to. Like, even if you just hold her from the middle like this, she doesn't like it. Most snakes don't. They want to have several points to hold on to. It makes them feel a lot safer. Okay. So we're going to see if we can get some footage of her in the grass and on a tree and everything. So you can see all kinds of neat stuff about her. And also, I really want you guys to see one of her skins from when she shed, since we were just talking about shedding because I noticed something really cool and neat about it that I want to show you. It is pretty cool. I, I've seen hundreds of snake skins and I never actually noticed this. And Ivy noticed it. It's pretty cool stuff. So, thanks a lot, Ivy. And uh, let's go on to the next part. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see it, but being a snake, she has a really iridescent skin, which is all rainbowy when the sun hits it right. She's also got yellow on her face, which I know Chris has said that some black rat snakes do, but I haven't seen it. I haven't been able to find a picture of it. But Alina is actually half black rat and half Everglades rat. Daddy was a traveling man. So that's, I think, where she gets the yellow on her face from. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but snakes don't have eyelids, right? Um, so if you actually see something looks like a snake and it has eyelids, it's not a snake. It's probably a glass lizard, you know, a legless lizard or something like that. So snakes can't blink or close their eyes. And what they have is a plate, an actual scale that's over their eye. So they could get sand and everything right on their eyeball and it doesn't bother them at all. Right? And when they shed, it looks a lot like a contact lens if you really think about it. It really Let's does. Now check out this cool thing that Ivy discovered about their eyes on the shedded skin. It works better when it's when it's fresh and not dry, but it's got this extension that looks flat, this white part. But if you stick your finger in it, I don't know if you can see that, it pops out like an accordion. Because when she sheds, the contact lens part is under here. Can you see that? So it's inside out. But you can see it, it's hard. And uh, this pops out, and the base of it, it's like that white color, it has perfect, perfect, tiny little scallops all around it, when it en how it ends, how it touches the contact lens. Yeah, and it's, uh, the reason why their eyes like that is because that extra skin there, the accordion <laughs> qualities of the skin, allows it to turn its eye. Right? I don't know if that makes sense, but it's pretty cool. And that was another good point that Ivy 
uh, had made is their skin when they shed it is actually inside out. So we're looking at the inside of the skin right now when you really think about it. You know what else is neat? When you look at the scales here, they look pretty uniform, you know. But um, when she actually sheds a scale here or there, like sometimes she'll do when she's around my neck, it's shaped like a flower petal. And only the tip of it has color on it. So it's kind of neat because these, they sure don't look like flower petals. You know, even when they're on her, they don't look like flower petals, but they are actually. Pretty cool. You can kind of see it a little bit, how only the tips here have color. It's like that. 